Emma Cooksey, so nice to meet you. Thank you so much for joining us here. We're really My looking pleasure. forward to this. I have gotten um, a tremendous amount of questions from the community and followers. So I'm going to just get rolling with all of them. Okay. Um, but but to first welcome you, you are the host of the Sleep Apnea Stories podcast. You're a patient advocate and a board member of Project Sleep, a nonprofit raising awareness about sleep health and sleep disorders. Um, so Emma, of course, to begin, I would love it if you would take some time to share your story, which I don't know. You'll have to, you'll have to tell us if it, how unusual it is in, in terms of it sounds like, and of course you'll share it, you may have had this for many, many years, well before perimenopause and menopause. So I'm going to give you the floor. You let us know, and then um, we'll start with questions. Well, thanks so much for having me. I love it. Um, my story could take me three hours, but I'll try and do a very condensed version for okay. everybody listening. Take all the time. So I went undiagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea for about 10 years. So I was going to my doctor a lot, usually in tears, dealing with anxiety and a lot of daytime sleepiness. And I just felt terrible. So oftentimes obstructive sleep apnea is missed in women just because a lot of doctors are looking for older overweight men and um, because that's definitely a population that has a lot of obstructive sleep apnea but that leaves a lot of women going without a diagnosis for a really long time. So scooch forward <laughs> to when I was 30 years old. I'm originally from Scotland but I married my husband who's from Florida I met him in Scotland. We got married there. And then we moved here to Florida in 2007. I got, I was 30 years old. I got pregnant with my first child right away when we moved and she had been born and I knew that she was sleeping through the night. So I was like, why am I still so tired? This doesn't really make sense. And I went to the doctor and of course I've been told over the years, you're just tired because you're stressed or you're just tired because you are pregnant was one you're just right. tired because you have a new baby so I went to the doctor and I said I know you're going to tell me I have a new baby but the baby is sleeping really well and I'm still exhausted all day and I don't know what's wrong with me but there's something not right and the doctor said but you have a new baby so off you go kind of thing mm -hmm. Um, and I didn't felt, feel like I was really being heard, you know, which is frustrating. So then a couple of weeks after that, I was um, visiting my mother-in-law and I was driving home across a really busy bridge and I fell asleep at the wheel. Oh. And so I had my baby in the back seat and fortunately I slammed on my brakes in time and we didn't hit anything on the bridge, but I was absolutely terrified. And that was enough of a wake up call that I needed to go and get my sleep looked into right I needed wow. a referral to somebody who knew about it so that was how I got my my I finally just went back to that doctor and I said well I just fell asleep at the wheel so we need to do something and they referred me for a sleep study and they told me you you have obstructive sleep apnea and I started treatment with a CPAP machine so then scooch forward again <laughs> busy I had another child and then a couple of years ago, um, actually during the beginning of the pandemic, I was at home um, and I was trying to look for like a project. And the thing that really stuck in my head was I'd been to my doctor and I was flicking through one of those like magazines in the waiting room. And I came across an article all about obstructive sleep apnea. And it was talking about CPAP machines. But then at the end, it said, there's all these other treatments. There's you know, things that I had never heard of. And I was like, why does anybody know about this? Right. And also, I didn't know any other women who had sleep apnea. So um, yeah, I started my podcast. And so that's been like two years of interviewing people all about this. But yeah, it links into perimenopause a lot. Because oftentimes, the symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea will look very like menopause symptoms. So not only do the symptoms look similar, and um, making it really difficult to spot, 
It's also that obstructive sleep apnea actually becomes a lot more common in women going through menopause. Partly that's because of weight gain and partly that's because of just all of the tissues in your throat becoming, um, you know, like less toned. Basically. Yes. And so people get it a lot more commonly. So Does that explain a little bit. <laughs> yes, it explains so much. And thank you for starting us off there. And I just want to highlight a few things. Um, first of all, it's awesome. And I, the pandemic sort of like catapulted so many people into something new. And yes. although it's on the heels of this thing that you're living with, this condition that you live with, um, it's, it's to all of our benefit that you kind of pivoted into this. So thank you uh, for, for sharing your story. I just want to clarify something which sounds so silly, but obstructive sleep apnea, is that the same? Is that the actual title? Because I have to tell you in all of my kind of back research um, of, of our, ahead of our conversation, I never saw obstructive Okay, and so I'll quickly explain the difference. Yeah, please, so, thank you. Sleep apnea is a term that covers all sorts of um, pauses in breathing. So essentially what sleep apnea is, is pauses in breathing at night um, where it can either be caused because of an obstruction, which is what obstructive sleep apnea is. So that's either your tongue and your soft tissue falling back and blocking your airway, or it can be caused by a collapse of your airway. So either way, okay. it's obstructing the air getting through your, your upper airway and into your lungs, right? Mm -hmm. Then there's something else called central sleep apnea. So it's less common than obstructive sleep apnea. And what happens there is there's something wrong with the signal going from your brain telling you to breathe. Similar outcome in that you stop breathing multiple times all night. Um, and so those people will feel tired and, and all of that. They just, the reason that they're stopping breathing is different from obstructive sleep apnea. Okay. And then you also have, if you want to be very thorough, Please, there's yeah. also mixed sleep apnea where people have um, both of these conditions. So there's something wrong with the way that their brain's telling, um, sending the signal to breathe, but there's also an obstruction in their airway. And so okay. people have that and they call it either mixed or complex sleep apnea. Mixed but or complex. Obstructive sleep apnea though, which is what okay. I have. And, and the second one, the brain signal problem Central is called. Sleep apnea. Say again one more time. Central sleep Central. apnea. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay. And so, so what it looks like um, can vary in different people and can it, can it vary in the same person over time? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so it's worth saying also that the symptoms of sleep apnea vary tremendously between people and especially between men and women. It can look very different. So did, did I have time just to go through some of the symptoms? Please, we have an hour. Okay. I don't want to take more than that, but I will if you like. Okay. So please no problem. share as much as you like. So one of the biggest things with sleep apnea is people feeling daytime sleepiness. So yeah. even though they sleep all night, they're finding themselves drowsy and sleepy during the day. So especially that can show up in drowsy driving, which obviously is really serious. Yeah. Um, people who need so much coffee to make it through the day, right? And this, of course, can be caused by all sorts of things. So I know that you've talked before um, to an insomnia specialist. So obviously insomnia can be a problem. Mm -hmm. But if you're asleep and staying asleep most of the night and you're really, really tired during the day, it's worth going to see a board certified sleep specialist to check whether you have a sleep disorder, right? Okay. And so specifically obstructive sleep apnea, some of the other common symptoms. Now, you don't have to have all the symptoms to have sleep apnea. So there's plenty of people who are just very anxious and tired and that's how they knew right but then a lot of people snore mm -hmm. so if you imagine that what's happening when you have sleep apnea is your 
stopping breathing. So if you have a bed partner, they can sometimes notice this in you, right? Mm -hmm. They'll notice that you're breathing and then there's a pause. And then usually someone will start breathing again with a sort of snort kind of like, yep, (laughs) right? Like a gasping, and, snoring, and gasping kind of for mm-hmm. air and those kind of things. And so it's difficult for the person with the condition because oftentimes you're not adequate. You're actually waking up. What's happening is your um, airway is becoming obstructed. Your brain realizes it's not getting enough oxygen. So it sends lots of stress hormones to wake you up so that you breathe right? Which is good that your body does that because it keeps you alive. Sure, But that happens with some people um, multiple, multiple, multiple times all night. So you're effectively in fight or flight all night because very stressful and you're not going into deep sleep. So oftentimes that's why anxiety can be a huge part of this. So I've talked to so many people who noticed that they were waking up in the morning with a feeling of pounding chest like the, they're being chased by a bear and mm-hmm. um, this is how I always explain it because this is how I felt for years and just a sense of impending doom and everything's not okay because your nervous system is so overloaded from all of this waking up constantly all night and um, so anxiety I think is an often l- overlooked symptom and that obviously comes up a lot with perimenopause as well mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, But if you have unexplained anxiety or it's new or especially if you're tired during the day as well, it really can't hurt to get it checked out. Right. So some of the other things that happen are frequent bathroom breaks during the night. And so that's partly because of there's a bunch of like different hormones going on that are disrupted with obstructive sleep apnea. So you don't go into that normal you know, stage where you wouldn't need to pee or whatever. So obviously for women, especially women in their 40s who have had children, oftentimes we look on on that as quite normal that people are having to get up to use the bathroom. But if that's happening multiple times a night, that also can signal sleep apnea. Um, Another thing is teeth grinding, (laughs) grinding and clenching of your teeth um, can can be a symptom of sleep apnea again not everybody has all these symptoms but you start to see a picture right I had absolutely all of these symptoms when Mm. somebody finally asked me about the one you know I didn't really know what I was looking for Mm. and because why would you right we're not talking about this condition and so yeah brain fog is another one which is extremely common with perimenopause and extremely common with obstructive sleep apnea or any sleep apnea you just have difficulty finding words you have that feeling like you're just in a fog and you can't form sentences and think of what you're trying to think of and so for some people that over time can become a cognitive um problem like I've interviewed a number of people who um they've been to a number of doctors and eventually they're like yeah you have a cognitive problem or even early onset Alzheimer's yeah, right yeah just from not having enough oxygen to your brain at night okay this is a little overwhelming I have to say and it's it's fascinating because there is this overlap between perimenopause and the symptoms of sleep apnea and I'm thinking and you mentioned this already but the numbers of women who may go undiagnosed for so long because maybe they're stressed, maybe they've had children recently, maybe they're just, you know, alcohol is disrupting their sleep or whatever it is, they're getting told that it could be any number of these things and maybe not getting this diagnosis. So, which makes me think you were finally diagnosed when you had, um, when you were able to enter a sleep study. Now, can you just clarify for a second, when I hear sleep study, my understanding is it's something that you need to be approved for. Is it something that's prescribed by a doctor? Can yes. any one of us at this point go to our doctor and say, I think that I might have this issue. I would like to be in a sleep study or is it more like I'd like to go get this diagnosis? Or so the exam terrific test? question. Okay. So it depends where you are, right? Okay. In the ideal circumstance you would go to your 
pri- most people, you would go to a primary care physician and you would explain your symptoms. They would spot that that could be obstructive sleep apnea or any any sleep disorder, really. Like, you know, if, if you're showing up and saying that you have daytime sleepiness and you slept all night, then really that warrants, I think, you know, uh, further investigation. So ideally what would happen is that primary care physician would refer you to a board certified sleep specialist. So those doctors are um, usually pulmonologists or neurologists, but then they go on to train as sleep specialists. And there aren't enough of these sleep specialists in the country for the for the population. So if you live in a major city, the chances are you would have access to one. There's a lot of people in more rural parts of the country who they, their nearest sleep specialist is, you know, 600 miles away or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, so oftentimes primary care physicians are managing this or sending people for sleep studies and um, looking at the results and deciding on treatment. But ideally, if people listening think that they have a problem with their sleep, the best person to go to would be a board certified sleep specialist. Okay. And so things are changing pretty rapidly at the moment, like with a lot of the new technologies and wearable devices. And um, there are some. So depending on your symptoms and what your doctor thinks, some people can have home sleep tests. So they're a lot less involved, like there's a lot less wires and there's not much to that. You can do it in your own home. You just go and pick up the device from the sleep clinic and, you know, follow their directions and you can sleep in your own bed and all that. Other people who maybe just have more going on where they're not sure if multiple sleep disorders might be involved. Those people usually will be sent to a clinic where they go and spend the night um, you know, in a w- sleep clinics are not like I think they used to be. It looks more like a sort of hotel room, right? <laughs> um, and they'll come and wire, they'll put electrodes on your head and various places on your body, and it just gives them all the data they could possibly need. Um, and so at the end of that, so I actually had a strange situation because I was breastfeeding my daughter. And I really didn't want to go to a clinic and the insurance company, of course, it being America, a lot of it's to do with insurance companies and what they'll pay for. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So with mine, um, the the doctor said, yes, yes, we do need to get you a sleep study. But after going back and forth with the um, with the insurance company, they had a system where they could actually do a full it's called a polysomnogram. That's the name for a, a sleep study. And they said that they could send a sleep tech to my home, wire me up with the full, um, all the electrodes you would normally get at a sleep clinic, but I was to sleep in my own bed with all the wires and with several laptops beside me and all that. So there's a lot of different options. The main thing is just to get tested, right? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Thank you so much for that. I think that's really helpful. And I just want to pause for a second. And, and share with you a couple of comments. Um, Shelly writes, I'm 47 and was diagnosed at 26. I was embarrassed for a long time because I didn't know any young women who lived with it. And Nettie has offered, I'm 56 and was diagnosed with mild obstructive sleep apnea three years ago. I was never tired during the day, but yeah. I snored a bit. I'm sure yeah, you hear absolutely. I mean, I hear like this, this constantly. The, the, the level of shame and embarrassment around this is yeah. huge. It's like yeah. people don't, um, I think partly because of the stigma around the treatment options. So a lot of people don't know all of the treatment options or they think like, I don't want to wear like a CPAP mask to yeah. keep my airway open at night. Yeah. Um, And so I think part of it, like, I definitely felt that way. Like I had friends that when I started my podcast were like, I didn't know you had that Mm -hmm. because I just didn't really talk about it. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I think that the problem is there's so many people in the same situation, not talking to each other. So that's partly why I wanted to create a community for people to really feel included and 
I have to say you are doing it and you've done it so well. If there's anything that I got out of looking at your work, it's your intense empathy and really sort of getting away, sort of clearing the the clutter around any embarrassment or shame or anything. And honestly, I got so many questions from people. I think so many women at least suspect that they are living with this. So I'm going to pivot a little bit and start getting through some of these questions because there really are so, yeah, so many. It. I love it. It's my um, favorite thing. Okay, good. Um, some of them may be overlapping a bit of what you said, but I think it it may be helpful to sort of hear again. Um you mentioned already that it tends to be overweight men who at least are diagnosed with sleep apnea, but someone asked, um, who is at risk of developing sleep apnea? Clearly we know everyone is at this point, but is there more? Yeah. So it's worth saying, like, um, if you talk to any sleep specialist, they're going to tell you like weight can be a huge factor in sleep apnea. Okay. But having said that, there's a lot more to it than that. Like there's a lot of people um, who are developing sleep apnea because of issues to do with. So for me, I was a mouth breather as a child. I had huge tonsils obstructing my airway. So oftentimes if people don't develop correct nasal breathing habits and their tongue doesn't mm. sit at the roof of their mouth, They don't develop enough room in their jaws for for everything to sit. And so oftentimes those people, their tongue ends up kind of just being too big for their their mouth. So that's definitely what happened with me. And so there's certain people in those kind of situations. So I would say like people who have had allergies and um, tonsils by themselves can obstruct people's airways. Um, I had somebody who was recently on my podcast who um, went years without a diagnosis and eventually had their tonsils taken out and now their sleep apnea is completely resolved. Um, So that by itself can be a big factor. Um, So what have we got? We've got weight. We've got um, also people... um, you know, I, I think like one of the things that we don't talk about a lot is how this runs in families as well. Really? Like people who have smaller, you know, kind of nasal cavities and just don't have as much room to breathe. Sometimes that can be a factor. So oh. oftentimes what a lot of practitioners will talk about is people starting off with quite narrow airways and just not enough room. And then as they gain weight, you know, it will put more pressure on their airway that was already really small. Sure. So that's also a factor. But um, yeah, like mainly I think um, one of the things that we really need to get away from is just the idea that only overweight yeah. older men have this condition. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like that's just. Well, I think too, you know, you brought all sorts of people with it. Yes. Yes. And you, you clearly threaded the needle between this condition and hormonal changes, which Mm -hmm. is, um, someone asks, you know, is this really, is this something that can develop in midlife? Is this connected to my perimenopause? And if you want to expand on that a bit more, I know. Yeah. So, so here's one of the problems with sleep apnea is just that there's so much research we still don't have. Right. And I think that especially in women, it would be great to see a lot more research studies to really show, but what they're thinking is as women age, they have a couple of different things going on. So oftentimes they have weight gain, but then they also have um, like a loss of muscle tone and all of these different muscles in their throat that are keeping their airway open. So sometimes just the going through like perimenopause can just be a time where people do tend to gain some weight and they also lose muscle tone. So those right. two things together can be enough to to make those women at higher risk for right. sleep apnea. Right. Um, can it be reversed? Someone asked. 
And I think piggybacked off of that, Kent, and you mentioned someone you spoke to just now who had it resolved by having her yeah. tonsils removed. But I think that's the other part of the question is, can it be resolved? Okay. So yes, <laughs> but it all but, depends. Okay. <laughs> right. So this is one of the things that makes this condition so frustrating to deal with because it varies so much between people. So in all the different interviews I've done over two years, I talked to someone like I just talked about who they had their tonsils removed. That was what was causing their obstruction and they never had to deal again and they didn't need their CPAP anymore. I talked to somebody else who was dealing with obesity and she had a bariatric surgery. And the same thing happened where a few months after the bariatric surgery and only a few months, like she hadn't yeah. even really lost very much weight, but for, for whatever reason like that really helped her and then she didn't need her CPAP. So those things happen. Another um, couple of people I've interviewed have had double jaw surgery. So they um, they had exactly what I was talking about, where they were mouth breathers and their jaws didn't really fully develop. And then essentially double jaw surgery, they make they break your jaws and move forward right. uh, your jaws, right. which, which obviously creates a much bigger airway. So for, and this is not every single person, right? So if somebody has, sometimes people will do that surgery and it will reduce the number of times an hour they stop breathing, but it won't completely eradicate it. But a couple of the people I've interviewed, that surgery completely got rid of their sleep apnea. But I would caution everybody just to like, I, I get a lot of people that will ask me, you know, what's the cure for that? Yeah. And, how do I get rid of that completely? And, mm -hmm. and it's kind of so dependent on why your airway is collapsing in the first place, right? And oftentimes we don't really know, like, you know, is it, it could be a combination. Like there's a lot of treatments that um, are available now, which work to tone and strengthen your tongue. Like there's a thing called XIOSA you use during the day. Um, you, and it's kind of like a TENS machine. It like stimulates the muscles in your tongue and tones and strengthens everything. And that with mild sleep apnea, only snoring and mild sleep apnea. But for those people, some of those people then no longer have to do anything at night because that works for them. Well, if somebody also has an airway that's collapsing, strengthening right. your tongue is not going to solve that, right? Okay. So there's also things like there's a... um there's also management tools, right? So things like CPAP is the most common one that people talk about. So that will, for a lot of people, that will keep their airway open at night. They can sleep much better. They have a much better quality of life and they're happy with that solution. Another one for mild to moderate sleep apnea is going to a dentist who can fit you for what's called a mandibular advancement device. So it moves your lower jaw forward and opens your airway that way. Another thing you can do is um, there's a treatment called um, the Inspire Implant. And that's, I interviewed a woman who had that. Her tongue was kind of the main issue, like it was blocking her airway. So this um, implantable device kind of, as she breathes in, it moves her tongue out of her airway. So for her, that gave her life back and she's happy with, with that solution, right? So as far as like actually reversing it, um, I think that, yeah, there's there's no like one, you know, quick fix. I have certainly found a combination of, um, I've been doing palate expansion, which is a whole nother thing, which is quite an experimental thing to give you more space in your nasal cavity. Um, so that's been helping me. There's also a, a, a thing called myofunctional therapy, um, which essentially takes those of us who have been lifelong mouth breathers and turns us into nasal breathers with correct oral rest posture. And that supports really good breathing during the day. And the idea is that then that retrains you to have better breathing at night. So okay. these things are not... Um, you know, like for me, I'm still using a CPAP machine, but it seems like my pressure has reduced as I've been improving the way that I breathe. So 
the, all of these things, we need more research to really know, right? Like, okay. Yeah. Um, so Emma, since you, you've sort of shared all of the options as it were for treatments, if there are any, please, you know, fill, fill in any blanks, but if you could actually share a bit more about the CPAP device, that would be great. You, you highlight it so um, successfully and often in your, in your work. And I'm just wondering what it is. And again, is this something that one would know to use because they're given a diagnosis and yes, this is the suggested um, so, treatment? Yes. So oftentimes um, when a person has a sleep study, they'll be seeing a sleep specialist and when that diagnosis comes back, oftentimes, um, oftentimes doctors will talk about, you know, weight loss can help improve this condition and different things that you can do. There's also positional therapy where, where you can change the way that you sleep, which for some people helps. Sure. But aside from that, they're oftentimes going to prescribe people CPAP. And so um, CPAP stands for continuous positive airway pressure. And you wear a mask which delivers this uh, constant flow of air. And, and the idea is that that then keeps your airway open at night. And the reason doctors often prescribe it to people is it's shown to be really safe, really effective. And people can use it that night. And it tends to, um, you know, it, there's a lot of data available. So, so to kind of explain... I don't know how I can like, so there's a mask and a hose mm -hmm. and it sits on your nightstand mm -hmm. and it's a machine that essentially just like pumps air. It has to be set to the specific pressure by your doctor okay. um, that you need to keep your airway open. Um, these days they have machines that are what's APAP, which is an auto titrating CPAP. Mm -hmm. So uh, I won't get too into the whole thing, yeah, yeah. but like, yeah, so any PAP therapy device is positive airway pressure and it's keeping your airway open by pumping air in. Does that So Emma, it? it is it is helpful because also you mentioned that you're getting myofunctional therapy, is that right? And it seems yep. to be reducing the pressure needed, right. so that's the pressure you're talking about. Which for exactly. And okay. that's been making it more comfortable for me because I think like um I think oftentimes people are like all or nothing. I want to do, you know, but, um, you know, they want like a solution that they just are one and done yeah. they have a surgery and they never have to think about it again. But in my experience, that's not really, <laughs> you know, like I think for me, it's been a gradual process of improving things over time. Yeah. So a lot of the things that I've done have definitely improved. Like I sleep on my side and not my back. And that helps to keep the idea of that is it keeps your tongue from falling back into your airway. And mm -hmm. um, I also sleep at an elevated position just because for some people that helps as well. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also to do with just the position of your tongue. And um, so again, there's like, you know, a lot of doctors will look at those kind of things. They'll be able to look at the data from your sleep study and tell did this person have more of these pauses in breathing when they were on their back? And so then mm -hmm. they might suggest you sleep on your side. So I think that all the different things together can, can really add up to a better quality of life. That's what I'm experiencing. Yeah. Um, compared with when I first started, it's worth yeah, saying can... you can't really talk about CFAT without talking about the, it can be really tough. Like it's, it's really challenging to get used to in the beginning for a lot of people. Um, and I don't think there's enough support out there for people. But um, that's another reason why it's really great to have my community just because I can help people, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm glad you bring that up. First, that you bring up that there may be a multi-pronged approach to getting... Well, let me ask you this. Is, is, is it to getting a better night's sleep... Yeah. over time. Right. That that's yeah. the goal. Right. Yeah. And, and so, so there may be many things that need to be altered yeah. over time, even that can help you do that. And with that, I really appreciate also that you said 
that there's maybe not a lot of support and specific to having to use this CPAP device. Also, I yeah. imagined that it wasn't particularly easy to get used to using, but yeah. you're confirming that. So could yes, you talk a absolutely. bit more about that? Yeah. So um, oftentimes, I mean, I think that my experience was probably like the worst of the worst. Like I pretty much was handed a CPAP machine in a bag with a man's large uh, mask, <laughs> um, which didn't fit my face at all. And so that just set me up for having leaks where it doesn't really Gosh. work properly because all the air shooting at the side of the mask and it's not really right. So there's a lot of different masks, which I think people are not aware of. So people who can breathe well through their nose, there's nasal pillow masks, which are very small and very unobtrusive. They don't touch the rest of your face. It's really just like right here um, compared with this full face mask people are familiar with. Right. So people that can breathe out their nose really do have a lot of options that tend to be a lot more comfortable. So nasal pillow masks, nasal masks that just fit over your nose. Um, even full face masks, they now have different designs where some of them are over your nose and some of them are under your nose. There's lots of accessories nobody talks about um, to make all of these different masks even more comfortable. So mm -hmm. there's things like CPAP mask liners. Um, there's you know, covers for your straps so that they, they're really soft material. So you don't get any lines right. or problems. So there's a lot of things like that, that I think that if people were told ahead of time, um, it might set them up for better success. But the main takeaway as well is CPAP's not for everybody. You know, mm. there's certain people I've interviewed who really have terrible claustrophobia that they just can't wear the mask, right? So for those people, um, you know, they look, there's other options available for them. They might be, you know, like the, the Inspire implant I talked about where it moves your tongue, like that could suit some people, like not everybody is eligible for all these different treatments, but it's worth at least having the conversation with your doctor. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Emma, someone just asked, is there a genetic component? And I know you spoke about sort of genetics, the genetics of somebody's structure mm -hmm. um of maybe i guess their nose their mandible but there, is there more than that so there can definitely i think oftentimes um until more recently people had always just said it's just a genetic thing there's nothing you can do about it and you know weight gain makes it worse but i think now we're learning a lot more about how mouth breathing and you know, orthodontic extractions and retractive braces are just making um, people's jaws smaller, right? So that's right. definitely, a, I think it used to be that I would be like, it's really controversial, but I think now it's not really as controversial. There's a wonderful book called Breath by James Nestor. Um, so if people want to learn more about some of the things that feed into developing obstructive sleep apnea, that's a really good book. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, you talked a bit also earlier, but if you would, sorry, just go through a little bit again, someone asked what happens if it goes untreated? And you did talk about sort of great like question. brain fog in particular and where that can go. But. So that's a really great question. So I've interviewed a number of really great sleep specialists on my podcast. So people can always go there to really, really hear all about it. But in general terms, um, moderate and so so sleep apnea is split into mild, moderate and severe. So they use a, a thing called the AHI or apnea hypopnea index. And what that does is shows them from the sleep study how many times an hour you stop breathing. So for mild sleep apnea so if it's less than five they just tell you you don't it's not clinically significant they don't bother treating it and they just say well some people start breathing sometimes and um, <laughs> okay. if it's above which I'm kind of like really because that's, yeah, that's, anyway, that's, that's okay. a whole other thing so yeah. if it's less than five you won't find many doctors that you know they're probably not going to prescribe CPAP at that level I wouldn't have thought 
So then 5 to 15 is mild sleep apnea. And then between 15 and 30 is moderate sleep apnea. That's what I have. And then anything above 30 events per hour. So imagine how many times someone's stopping breathing. That's considered severe sleep apnea. So for moderate and severe sleep apnea, um, doctors are really keen to get those people into treatment because there are long-term health consequences um, linked to that. So whether it's like cardiovascular problems, um, stroke is a really serious one, AFib, like there, there's a bunch of things that are kind of linked together. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, there's some pretty serious health consequences for people leaving this untreated. Um, I've certainly talked to people who have lost loved ones to nocturnal stroke. I was wondering that. Oh, that no, that's terrible. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Emma, so, uh, just to go ahead. No, just please, really please. briefly. So please. the mild sleep apnea is something that there's definitely a big debate about because they haven't shown as many negative long term health consequences with mild sleep apnea. So for some of those people, um, doctors might say, lose some weight, do some things, but may not choose to treat it with CPAP. So it just really depends on the individual person, how much their life is impacted. Mm. Um, you know, if somebody is not really bothered by any symptoms and they just kind of came because their wife said they snored and, you yeah. know, like, like, and they have mild sleep apnea sometimes those people depending on what the doctor decides having talked to the patient in their individual case um treatment is not quite as vital for those people as the people with moderate and severe sleep apnea okay okay thank you um Emma, just, just to make the connection again between perimenopause menopause and sleep apnea or obstructive sleep apnea did things worsen for you during, per I don't know, I, I should back up and ask, are you perimenopausal? Are you post, are you in, are you in menopause? I'm, so I'm 45 and I would say I'm definitely in perimenopause. Um, but at the moment, like it's not really affecting me that much. I just noticed that my periods got a lot heavier and I every so often will have quite strange, like palpitation feelings. Yeah. So that's kind you're of in the right I, place to talk about. All right. Exactly. <laughs> and I'm just yeah. like from that's why I'm excited to talk to you. I'm like, well, let's <laughs> talk all about me. Um. So far, I haven't been like super affected by it. But from what I've read, I'm like, well, that's what that is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm super interested. I'd love to connect with you again, like as you go further down the road yeah. of perimenopause and into menopause, because I, I, you know, you really laid out this case for this overlap of symptoms yeah. and sort of wondering and knowing what's what. And I'm, I would be curious to hear if having this years long journey, working on your sleep and improving your sleep has sort of lessened that, that, blip on your perimenopausal radar and it may not be as impactful for you because you're already doing things that help to mitigate some of that yeah. but I I think that um I definitely feel like I'm figuring out my sleep part of it okay um it's taken me years I've been on CPAP for 14 years yeah and my sleep to begin with was not good yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know I just was dealing with like not having the right mask and it just took a long time to figure out CPAP and then over time I've been able to improve some of these other factors and I now feel like I'm getting much better sleep than I have for certainly you know the whole time I was undiagnosed was terrible mm. so the sleep part of it I feel like is actually pretty you know getting better for me um but yeah, I don't know. It'll be interesting. I think I feel like I'm just at the beginning of the whole yeah. thing. So yeah, no, it will be interesting. And and I'm glad you brought up um, sort of how you're feeling now. I did want to ask you that in in a bit, but if you'd like to expand further now, yeah. Um, so so a lot of 
I think I read, I think it was either an article or it might have actually been a podcast interview with Gwyneth Paltrow. And she was talking about um, how she was on a plane and got her period like a few days early and it just and bled through, you know, like the whole thing, like her yeah, pants. Yeah, was and hemorrhaging everything. on the and, plane. And it was just not like it was not normal for her. Like it yeah. really seemed very unusual. And so I had a situation like that about maybe um, almost a year ago where I was like, oh, wow, this is way more than <laughs> mm-hmm. than normal for me. Right. So mm-hmm. but I find that it's kind of been like and then I'll have a couple of the thing that's frustrating is it's not just one thing. It's like it will come and go. And then I'll have a couple of months that seem totally normal. Right. Right. And then I'll be like, oh, it's a really heavy period again, you know. Yeah. So that was definitely a thing. And then the the palpitation feeling, like, I mean, I can maybe tell you about it and you can tell me if it's perimenopause things. So I don't know <laughs> enough about it. But I just would have this feeling, and I don't know whether it's necessarily like a hot flush or flash or whatever. But I one day was in my car and I was sitting at a red light and I was not so I've had things before where I've been very stressed and I had that like my heart's pounding and I you know don't feel great but this was not that this was just sitting at a light sort of listening to the radio and I suddenly felt like from within my body I just felt really hot and just oh you were flashing you were flashing Emma yeah and then and then I had this feeling of like um I mean, palpitations is is how I would Common. describe it. Yeah, yeah. just mm-hmm. not right and like really like, like yeah, yeah. Um, so that happened maybe like six months ago, and mm-hmm. then it since then, you know, a couple of times, but not as bad as that. Yeah. So I'm kind of like I'm kind of flirting with it. I'm not. Yeah. I don't feel like I'm like right <laughs> yeah, in it, but yeah. Yes, I know. I know that sense of I'm flirting with it, but oh, it's probably not a big deal. And then suddenly, sometimes for some right. people, it really it comes on strong. Yeah. I just I see that, that there's a comment and I want to um, get that to you. Uh, and I Katie, have plenty of friends who are definitely through it and friends yeah. who are like in it. And oh, yeah. It. So it's I'm glad that we're talking about it more. I'm glad we're talking about it. too. Yeah. <laughs> too. It's, we love to talk about it. Okay. Katie says, I do get up many times in the night to use the bathroom, but I do need to void my bladder. I also notice that water affects me less than say, if I drank any caffeine, should I be concerned about sleep apnea? So this, thank you for that question. And this actually, um, if I might couple it with a, a, a couple of other questions that had come in, when people asked about caffeine, alcohol, um, sort of the things that come up and become for some people in perimenopause and menopause, they become more sensitive to these things and yes. they notice, oh, if I have wine, I'm up all night, right? That's a yeah. common one you hear. But but is is caffeine or you know drinking too much too close to bed or these things that are sleep disruptors, things that people with sleep apnea should be even more cognizant of? So I think that, uh, so the first thing would be for the, the lady that asked the question. Yeah. Um, so I would, I would really take stock of, do you have other symptoms, right? If that's the only thing happening, maybe not. But if you are very tired during the day, you have anxiety, you might have brain fog. Like if, if there's a lot of things going on that might suggest something going on with your sleep, I would go and see your doctor and talk about it because it can't really hurt. Right. Um, so as far as caffeine and alcohol, people are not going to like what I say. I know we, we, I'm sure um, we've heard it. I'm sure we've heard it. Go ahead. And we never like so it. We listen. I'm, to- I'm not a doctor and I'm not, you know, like a healthcare provider. So, you know, I can speak from my own experience and also from all the different people that I've interviewed. But I certainly hear a lot that alcohol and caffeine, caffeine at the wrong time of the day. So I think a lot of people think that all caffeine is really bad. But if you have it first thing in the morning, 
and it's been long enough until you go to bed, it probably isn't having an impact on your sleep. But yeah, people drinking caffeine later in the day, probably not a great plan. So right. I can only speak for myself. But for me, I um, gave up caffeine about 15 years ago. Mm, really? And yes. when I say gave up, I dabble in decaf coffee before <laughs> noon sometimes, okay. which my husband doesn't call caffeine. He's just like, that's not even coffee. <laughs> But um, so that, but apart from that, I have peppermint tea or water and whatever. So I think for me personally, caffeine's horrible. If they mess up my order at Starbucks, I feel like I'm going to have a panic attack because I'm not used really? to caffeine at all. Yeah. It's very like, I guess I just have a very sensitive system and it's just not for me. So that's my own experience. Feel a lot better than when mm. I used to have coffee and and did caffeine so then more than a year ago I read a book called quit like a woman have you heard of that no okay it's a wonderful book quit so, like a woman yes and it is a book about women and alcohol and how there's no discussion around alcohol which isn't at the extremes of I have a really serious addiction problem and I have to you know, get in a program and give up alcohol completely can never have any. And people that are just have no problem at all and can drink all they like and, and it's fine not affecting them. So her book is about what about the rest of us who are kind of in between? Mm -hmm. So some of the things that were happening with me, so I had have struggled with anxiety and depression my whole adult life. And so I take an antidepressant um, which really helps. And I know we could talk all about that because that's what yeah, it means as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, but I found kind of coming into this midlife thing a couple of years ago, I started to feel even if I had one or two glasses of wine, I would feel the next day really quite gloomy and my mental health was not where it would normally be. Yeah. And it started to kind of affect me more and more where I, I literally would have one glass of red wine and I love red wine, right? But I would have one glass of red wine and then wake up, it would disrupt my sleep and I would wake up at weird times and then in the morning I would feel really gloomy. Mm. And so having read that book, I thought, well, you know, I've never actually, because I'm from Scotland, right? So people drink all the time mm. so um I'd never in my adult life apart from pregnancies really gone a significant amount of time without drinking alcohol to know how I would feel so last let's think May um so a year and a bit ago I decided just to do a month and see how I felt and I felt so much better that I never oh, started. Again. Really? Wow. So I'm now kind of like sober. <laughs> yeah. But it's kind of an odd thing where people assume that, you know, you have an addiction problem. I don't. Right. I just feel a lot better not yeah. drinking alcohol. And I know it was significant improvements in my sleep. Thank you for sharing that. Um, but I know it's a bummer because I love. No, no, it's <laughs> not. It's not. And, and. I, I will say you're, you are in the right spot for sharing about all of these yeah. things. I, I certainly haven't spoken to anyone either here in these conversations or just in the community at large who hasn't shared that she is certainly with alcohol yeah, is feeling at the very least like it's not what it used to be. And it's not what it used to be even not that long ago. You know, like right. the, the glass that she had a year ago just feels different. Not yeah. only is there sleep disruption, but there may be, I have shared these feelings of gloominess and sadness and maybe yeah. anxiety the, the morning after things like this. Yeah. Um, I know we have to wrap up soon, but a couple more <laughs> questions. Um, someone asked about... Uh, and I guess this sort of circles back to the overlap in perimenopausal symptoms, but she asked about things um, like HRT or are there any supplements, any nutrition advice you can give or exercise that might be helpful? 
fall. Um, and, and it also makes me think too, how there's this approach that you mentioned, this multi-pronged approach to improving yeah. this condition or at least living better with it. So, so I get a little bit twitchy when people talk about supplements, because okay. just, just because I think that there's a lot of supplements out there claiming to do a lot of things. Yeah. I think that, um, you know, definitely optimum nutrition is key. And like, if you're not getting all the nutrients you need from your food, then supplementing is great. Um, again, I'm not a healthcare professional, so great. like, it's not really my area of expertise. I would say that for a lot of people um, with any sort of sleep issue, like I've definitely um, been doing like magnesium that can mm -hmm. definitely support um, healthy like, you know, your nervous system and your sleep and right. things like that. But beyond that, I mean, I think definitely movement is a huge help. Like I think having enough exercise during the day and also like exercise doesn't sound very fun to me. So I prefer movement. That's what okay. <laughs> I, doing. Do. I like so that I word do, too. I do a lot of swimming and walking and yoga and all those different things. And I think that um, that together with good nutrition like just as the foundation of whatever you're dealing yeah, with right it's good but anyway yeah so yeah I mean I definitely think most doctors talking about sleep apnea will definitely talk about you know weight loss it's just a problem for a lot of people because if your sleep is disrupted oh. that sets you up for the cycle of eat sugar to, <laughs> yeah, you know, perfect. stay awake because mm -hmm. you're so tired. So mm -hmm. I think that the first thing is find a treatment with, along with your doctor, you can find either a CPAP or the mandibular advancement device or any of the things we talked about and improving your sleep. So once your sleep apnea is treated and under control, then you're just going to get much better quality sleep. And that then enables you to like have this good cycle of I feel better. Therefore, I feel like moving more. I feel like eating better. Mm -hmm. I'm not reaching for sugar late in the afternoon just to stay awake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the hormone replacement therapy, do you know at all if there's anything out there about a connection between the two? I actually don't. That's okay. something I would be really interested to research, though. I do I know would... like that's one of the reasons I just don't know what to expect with my um, perimenopause through menopause, because my mom was on hormone replacement therapy pretty much the whole time. I know she had a really rough time for a few months and then she was on HRT for <laughs> years and right. then when she came off of it it was all finished <laughs> so yeah really? so she, that, she just kind of coasted through yeah which yeah. which is difficult for me going into it just I mean I totally understand that you know of course she had to do whatever yeah. suited her but I think that sometimes because there can be this you know link between other women in your family and what your experience might be and I don't have any of that information <laughs> yeah yeah no I think it, it's it's interesting and in, uh, other conversations I've had uh, you know we get into that with with um a, a sleep specialist we spoke to and HRT may be helpful for many women for various reasons so I'd love to follow yeah. up with you on that the Emma as far as sleep goes for you now, you just use the phrase that once you get your sleep sort of under control or your treatment under control, is that where you are now? I think so. Mm -hmm. Like it definitely the last, I would say, um, the last few years, especially working with a myofunctional therapist to really retrain myself and correct breathing I also worked with a breathwork coach and mm. that's just improved not only my breathing and and how I you know I'm naturally breathing at night but also my quality of life yeah. like that really is great for learning to kind of calm your nervous system and I think that I've got to a point with my CPAP where the pressure is a bit less than it was and it, you know, it's easier for me to have uninterrupted sleep. Um, 
there's all sorts of stuff I could explain about like that I'm doing this palette expansion thing but it's that's for another day because it's so okay. complicated we'll, we'll um, talk again I hope but yeah all those things together seem to really be improving so I, I feel like I'm at the point where my sleep apnea is managed and under control and you know I have less than five events an hour and you know which is what they they look at wow for... that's much improved then yes yes so yeah I mean I I think that it's also a level of acceptance that this is a chronic condition I'm living with right mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. I may maybe I'll figure it all out but also if I carried on how I am right now I have a really good quality of life and that would be fine you know oh, I love that thank you yeah. um What's next for you? You're busy with your podcast and and creating this community and so in January, I think you mentioned right at the beginning, in January of this year, I joined the board of directors of Project Sleep, mm -hmm. who are a nonprofit um who are working to raise awareness um of sleep health and sleep sleep disorders. So that was actually started by a woman called Julie Flygar who has narcolepsy. And she's developed all these great programs. And we became really fast friends when we met. And I started thinking, well, she has a program where she trains people living with narcolepsy to tell their story out in the media and in their own communities. And so we kind of got together and I was like, could we do that for people with sleep apnea? Oh, and she was great. like, yeah. So this year... They just start, they just have a whole program the summer running and they have five people with sleep apnea that are going through it. And so last summer, I was the first person with sleep apnea to kind of modify the program and to make sure that it fit for sleep apnea as well as narcolepsy. So we're going to expand that, which I'm really excited about. Um, and just look at programs we can put together to raise awareness and put really good unbiased information out there about yeah. sleep apnea, but all sleep disorders. I think that yeah. people think of sleep disorders as being really rare and they're really not. And um, when know. you consider insomnia together with sleep apnea, narcolepsy and, and all the other sleep disorders, there's so many people affected by them. So yeah. yeah, I'm just, that's what I'm super pumped about is just like getting a lot of awareness out there about it. Well, you are doing it and I will, um, I will let you go. This has just been a wonderful hour. Thank you so very much. It was Thank just you. a pleasure to learn and hear your story and hear all of what's happening um, kind of as far as treatment and aware. Anyway, you just do it. You, you're, 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 you're doing a beautiful, beautiful job of spreading well, the word. Thank you. And, Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone who made it here this hour and um, shared your experiences and your questions. And Emma, perhaps next year when you're sort of further into this work that you're doing, um, we can talk again. I'd love to yeah. hear kind of- I'm interested to see how the perimenopause goes. <laughs> Listen- be maybe on, I'll be really uh, in it. Let me tell still. you, you may be really in it. You may be, you may like, you may do great. I, I just, you're, I have to say your hot flashing story really resonates with me because I probably had one like two years ago. I wasn't even sure if that was it, right. you know, like maybe kind of sorta. And then I thought, oh, I'm done. Cause I'm 52 now. And I thought, oh, I, 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 I cleared that one. And then right. just in the last couple of months, it's been like rapid yeah. fire. And I, yeah. I did start taking HRT, which has resolved it, but, uh, yeah. So, so, you know, buckle up, stay in the community, <laughs> share all the feels and we're here to support you. I love Thank that. You Thank so you so much, Emma. It was just a pleasure Thank to meet you. you. Pleasure to spend Thank the you. hour. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Be well. Talk soon. Bye.